If you're a parent, teacher, or school leader, and you're sick and tired of the frustration, anger, and unfair treatment of children at high risk in our public schools, then perhaps it's time for all of us to do something about it. In this podcast, Dr. Amitra Berry brings you tips, tools, strategies, and tactics to build successful solutions while touching, moving, and inspiring all of us to transform our schools so that every child thrives. Here's your host, Dr. Berry. Hey there, Equity Warriors. I'm so glad we are together here again today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to channel Gandhi today, who said that no culture can live if it attempts to be exclusive. How's that for a thought? So as a thought experiment, I'd like you to think about a regular work day. And I want you to view it from a particular lens, a lens of racial diversity. So if you're driving, don't do this part. But if it's appropriate for where you are right now, close your eyes. And I want you to think from the time you get up in the morning until you go back to bed at night, think about your day. Who do you see? Are they the same race as you? Who is it that provides supervision and guidance to you on your job, in your classroom? To whom do you provide supervision and guidance? What do they look like? Is there a time and how often are you the only person of your race in the room? And think about how often the positive images reflective of your race appear in the media versus how often the negative images that reflect your race. Has it ever happened to you that someone you met for the first time was surprised to find out your racial identity? And has it ever occurred that someone asks if they can touch your hair, particularly a stranger? And did you ever or do you ever hear derogatory remarks about people of your race being disciplinary problems or unable to achieve academically? That one's specific to those of you who work in school systems. Now I want you to flip it. What if, what if none of the people or very few of the people you see every single day as you go throughout your day look like you, are of your race? What if all of your supervisors, everyone you've ever reported to, were of another race? What if in meeting after meeting after meeting, you're the only person of your race in the room and you're asked to give the opinion or insight into the mindset of every other person of your race? What if the images you see in the media of people who look like you are disproportionately negative? What if a new person that you meet that you've talked to on the phone several times, not been on a Zoom because now we can see each other. But what if these new people that you meet after having conversed with you somehow, or even if it's through email, are shocked to find out your racial identity? And what if a stranger standing behind you in line in the coffee shop just asked if they could touch your hair or just reached out and touched it without even asking? And what if... You're a teacher, let's say you're a teacher, and time after time again, you hear people making derogatory remarks about children of your race being disciplinary problems and unable to achieve. Imagine being a person whose lived experience 
every single day is that of the flip, day after day, year after year. Open your eyes. Let's get into it. Let's talk today about why it's important to have racial diversity among teaching staff and the benefits to all children, no matter what color they are, even the white ones, when this happens. So why is it that diversity in faculty composition, a diverse faculty, is so important? For those of you who may not have seen an image of me and can't tell by my voice, I am a black woman. I grew up in a racially diverse neighborhood. I went to schools with very racially diverse student compositions. I was in the sixth grade, though, before I had a teacher who was a person of color. <laughs> Oddly enough, her name was Mrs. Brown, but she was a black woman. And then in seventh grade, I had Mrs. Lopez, who was my science teacher, a Latina. And then in 10th grade, I had Mr. Huey, who was my geometry teacher. He was Chinese. And I can still remember sitting in the classrooms of those three educators. This is between 1974 and 1979. Now, I can't name most of my K-12 teachers off the top of my head, but if you've heard me speak, you've probably heard me talk about Mrs. Gowdy, who was a white woman, not discounting her, but for the purposes of this one, why diversity matters. I'm not including her here. But sitting in those classrooms with Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Lopez, Mr. Huey, there was an intangible difference in their classrooms that as an adolescent, I couldn't have named, but there was just something about being in their room. For children of color, seeing people who look like themselves as teachers and leaders, it has this profound impact and a lifelong effect from the research, we know that access to same race or same ethnicity teachers is a critical resource for supporting educational experience of experiences and outcomes of Black, Hispanic, and other students of color. Now, some of this is explained by teacher mindset, right? Because teachers and school leaders of color tend to have greater belief in the innate abilities of children of color. So they don't, as a result, they don't tend to have a negative not saying it never happens, but they don't tend to have negative implicit bias against children of color, at least not as frequently. There is, um, just saw this in my social media feed, there is a high school in Philadelphia, I think Philadelphia, not Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, where all of the black boys in this high school will have their core content, English, history, math, science, all of their core subjects will be taught by black educators. Representation matters. That is so, so powerful. This mechanism, though, that happens when we denigrate the intellectual ability of children of color affects the collective efficacy of children of color. That is to say that children of color begin to believe that they are incapable of achievement because everyone keeps saying that they're intellectually incapable of achievement. This constant criticism of children of color comes from a mindset in educators that says that those children cannot learn. That is deep, deep, deep down in the bottom of their icebergs because one would hope that they don't wake up in the morning going, oh, I can't wait to get into school to make my black and brown children feel less worthy or less intellectual. Bottom of their iceberg. And if it's down in the bottom of that iceberg, there are those who may feel like our children of color aren't worth the time and effort to teach them. But in truth, children of color's innate abilities, they're no different from those of white children. Intellectually, we all know this, but psychologically, there's this thing called implicit bias that overrides the facts. We've created a system of public education in this country in which roughly 80% of all teachers are white, but serving in systems where roughly 60% of students are of color. 
we don't have to look very hard or very far to find disproportionality and inequity in academic and disciplinary outcomes. They're everywhere. Achievement gaps at the local, state, and national level are fueled by provision gaps that occur when we allow the mindset, when we have schools that have a culture that children of color are less capable of learning. But here's what we know. Here's the cool stuff. Here's what we know from research and here's what we all need to take into heart and think about. That is that in classrooms that are led by teachers of color, students of color are less likely to be perceived as being inattentive. They are more likely to be held to high academic expectations. They have higher rates of attendance. My God, for no other reason. Get the ADA up. Let's have more teachers of color. They're much less likely to be perceived as disciplinary challenges, and they have lower rates of suspensions. Why? Because teachers of color respect the culture and they value what the child brings to the classroom. They're willing to work with the child and teach them a better way much more often. And if all of that isn't enough, if you're a, a, a district leader where you've got a black-white test score gap, know that you can eliminate one-third of that gap by having black students who have one or more black teachers. That's from the research. I didn't make that up out of my head. But what about the white kids? I'm sure you're wondering, of course. I'm about all children. What about the white kids having more teachers of color? Here's what's really cool. First and foremost, white kids are no worse off by having teachers of color than by having tight white teachers. But students of all races report some form of a socio-emotional benefit. They feel they've reported feeling more challenged academically in the classrooms that have teachers of color. Proximity breeds empathy. But distance and segregation breed ignorance of and fear. When you have teachers and leaders that reflect the diversity of races and cultures of your learners, understanding, compassion, and cultural awareness that they bring to their schools and classrooms creates inclusive spaces. Children feel connected. They feel like they belong. And we are, when we are connected and belong, we can be more engaged. When we're more engaged, we just do better. But when we have adults whose mindsets are tainted with privilege, and that happens whether you, whether not you personally, but whether one recognizes that they are exercising privilege or not, when we have those mindsets, it impacts the children. As leaders, you have to be courageous and run counter to the calls of the people that would have you thinking that DEI is something that it is not, that it's CRT, the boogeyman. You also have people who would have you believe that working to increase diversity among staff is reverse racism. It is not. You know what that is? That is is the voice of privilege. And as I said earlier, when you're accustomed to privilege, equity feels like tyranny. The challenge really is about quantifying equity when it comes to people, particularly when we're talking about recruiting and hiring, retaining people that have a tremendous impact on the lives and life trajectories of our children. Human capital people in an equity focused organization is about having the right people in the right positions skilled at doing the right things to get the outcomes that are desired by leadership. Hiring, training, 
retaining the right people means that we have to develop and implement practices that address the inequities that are currently happening in our systems. So if you're a school board trustee, lean in just a little bit closer. I want to talk to you for just a second. Your job is to create policy. Superintendent implements the policy, right? So I'm going to ask you to look at your policies. Create something that would require your HR departments to go beyond whatever their existing recruitment and retention best practices are. Superintendents, are you listening? You should be demanding PD to help recruiters and supervisors eliminate implicit bias from decisions about hiring and advancement. One of the first things you can get rid of is whatever screening tool you use and when you're looking at resumes that include names. My name is Almitra. Just knowing my name, you're probably going to guess she ain't white. If my name was Tamika or Shakira, you would probably say or think the same thing. If I was Allison Smith, you might think something different. A lot of our identities are in our names, and a lot of that is used to screen people who are highly qualified from our systems because of our own implicit biases. Look for teachers and leaders who come from schools or, or organizations, you know, higher ed, um, that come from places that have greater racial and ethnic diversity. Go to historically black colleges and universities. Look at affinity organizations. The National Alliance of Black School Educators, you've got the Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents, NAPSI and ALAS. They're great places to start. So talking specifically to my equity warriors who are school and district leaders and equity warrior parents, your task is to hold them accountable. We have to work to change mindsets and shift cultures, and that takes time. It takes about three years. But look at where you are as a district, as a system, as a school. Set a vision for what you want to be. What do you want it to look like, equity warriors? What is your utopia school district or your utopia elementary school or high school? What does that look like? Get a vision for it. And then armor up, create some audacious goals that, that include having a diverse faculty and an inclusive culture. What is that going to look like? How do you get there? There's a lot of things you can do. There's so much out there. Um, let me give you a couple. So um, internships and teacher residency programs right? Because we know all the data about um, marginalized peoples, black and brown people, and what type of debt they're likely to come out of college with compared to their white peers, right? So if you've got a teacher residency program or an internship, they're earning money while they are becoming a teacher. Cool, right? Um, what else can you do? What else can you do? Um, look at, at creating teacher pipelines from inside your communities, Right. There's I read one. I think it was in New York about a middle college model where they started in middle school with eighth grade students, putting them on a track to become an educator. So. We've got middle college high schools all over the place. What about having a middle college high school that has a curriculum 912 um, where part of their coursework is focused on pedagogy and socioemotional support? What about partnering with local universities and junior colleges to help you with that? That would be so cool, right? Here's another one. Um, look at your structural and cultural systems and then either work on creating one if you, if you don't really have anything or improving what's there so that training and support for teachers of color who, by the way, have disproportionately higher attrition rates um, who are more frequently challenged about their teaching styles, who are 
more often assigned more extracurricular duties than their white peers, right? So they've got all these added burdens. Um, I think about, I think about my first two teaching assignments um, where I taught at a middle school and a comprehensive high school. Um, at the middle school, I was the only teacher of color. Um, even though the student population was eh, bordering on becoming a majority of color. It can be professionally and culturally isolating to be in those assignments. So create some affinity groups. Now, it's hard to have an affinity group if you don't have any teachers of color, um, but create some affinity groups. That's one way to start. But also professional learning on cultural competency, right? Email me, go to askdrberry.com and send me a note. Let's have a talk about that. One other thing, and this is sort of a, when we talk about audacious goals, this one is truly audacious, but, um, and it's gonna require a coalition of equity warriors. So you're gonna to have to find and recruit, bring them in. Take a look at your certification exams for teachers in your state. There are still some states that require candidates to pass the praxis, but the praxis screens out almost half of the candidates of color, while it only screens out a little over 25% of the white candidates, which means it is culturally biased, okay? Um, get rid of it. Find other ways to make sure that teachers of color are ready for the classroom. And as always, join me every week. Send me your questions, topics, and requests to askdrberry.com, and I will answer those questions. I will bring you experts to help address those topics. Don't worry about things you cannot change. Change the things you can no longer accept. I'll see you next time. That's it for today's episode of the 3E Podcast. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. One lucky listener every single week that posts a review on iTunes will win a chance in a grand prize drawing to win a $25,000 value private VIP day with Dr. Barry herself. Be sure to head over to 3epodcast.com and pick up a free copy of Dr. Barry's gift. Then join us on the next episode.